Hi, this is Hyperwave. I'm Leah Wald here with Tyler Jenks. Gonna give you a tiny little, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna be in the background because that's like way better than me and, and Thor's going a little nuts. Okay, so uh, yes, we hit 8,500. People are very excited. You should be, oh wow, I hope people didn't get nauseous from that situation. <laughs> um, but let's discuss what this price action really means. So, and I know I'm in the dark here. Without further ado, hey Tyler, what's up? Hi everybody, uh, you can see behind uh, Leah the beautiful... Uh, but Tyler, your shirt belongs here actually. Yeah, it does. Maybe I'll come out later. I'll, I'll fly from Hawaii. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, beautiful ocean and beach and uh, the grass there, which is uh, what everybody should be doing is chilling out. Everyone's getting too excited about... Uh, these pops in Bitcoin. Um, and I mentioned this morning, I think this was an important one and I'm going to show you why. Uh, but when I say this is the time to chill out, I want to go to a much bigger perspective than these short jumps. Those people that uh, are not in Bitcoin, this will be an opportunity to lighten up at possibly higher prices, maybe five to $700 higher. If that's the type of uh, trading you do, if you're not in it and uh, you think it's going lower, I would agree. I am not in it. I will put none of my clients in it, uh, regardless of um, these short-term pops. But some of the short-term pops are more important than others. And I think this one might be, and I mentioned that for those traders, this is the type of thing that you look for. And I'm going to explain that even uh, they're called counter trend rallies. And um, we're going to explain it in terms of hyperwave. This is going to be a short one because there's not really much to say. Uh, but what I have to say is very important. So we're going to go through it pretty quickly. And the way I'm going to do it is, of course, by going to screen share and uh, pulling up some uh, charts that we have already looked at, but we are going to update them through today. So the first one, and uh, most of these are on Bitcoin Wisdom because that's where we built these for you several days ago to come to the conclusion there were about seven negatives and one positive and one neutral uh, on the type of indicators I uh, look for on these long-term trends. So uh, on this first chart, this is an update. We're at 84.59 right now. We got up uh, well over 85 uh, earlier on that spike. Um, and in this chart, what you see is my old phase three line, which is no longer a phase three line. Remember, it is now a trend line. So it has been downgraded from a phase three line, which is much more powerful than a trend line. But a trend line is powerful and uh, it, uh, it can uh, act as resistance or support. It acted as support on many weekly occasions going back uh, eight months. And um, now uh, it will become a trend line with some resistance on it. Also note that I've got my two moving averages on this chart. I've got a seven uh, week moving average and a 30 week moving average, which had a death cross four weeks ago, three and a half, almost four weeks ago. And that is, that is widening. The seven week is continuing down and the 30 week is continuing up. So the spread between them is getting bigger. That is a negative. We are below this trend line. That is a negative. Um, Let's go to the next chart. This is the stop and reverse point, and it is a negative. We are well below it. 
we'd have to get all the way up to uh, 11,455 before we can challenge that on a weekly basis. So that is a negative. This is the Bollinger Band that we talked about, where once you have broken from above the top line and you drop down to the middle line, you can often bounce off that middle line and go back up. We did not. We broke down below the middle line. We have not on four consecutive weeks been able to get above it, and then we've dropped below it, but we have not come down to the bottom line, which it will come down to on a probability basis, and that's around 40, that is right now around 40, I'm going to call it 4,400. Okay, that is a negative. Let's look at the next chart. These are the Fibonacci numbers. We, last week I said we were breaking back above the 61.8 retracement. This is the top, so that's zero. This is the first line, which is 23.6, which comes in at 15,164. This is the next Fibonacci line down the 38.2 which comes at 12,378. This is the next one, which is the 50% that we broke below. We actually broke below the 61.8% and closed below it. Now we are coming back up to the 61.8. And last week we did break above it and close above it. This week we came back down to it and are still holding above it. And to get back to the next line would mean we've got to get to 10,126. For those of you who have not listened to all of our vlogs, you know that I have a thing for 10,100 and 11,100, which are very powerful support and resistance lines. It will be a resistance line, and it is also very close to the Fibonacci line at 10,126. So I would consider this now because the low is on the 61.8, and we are trying to work our way higher as a short-term neutral, and I might even say positive, uh, so we'll call it a neutral plus, that could take us back as high as the next line, which is the 50% line at 10,100, but I doubt it. I don't think it's gonna make it that far because there's a lot of other resistance that we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Okay, the next chart is the downtrend line and everybody's drawing these in different ways. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and call this a positive because the way I'm drawing it, I'm drawing it from the very top through the opening of the next red candle, and then I'm connecting it to the opening of the next red candle. And um, the reason I do it that way is because all of the bodies of the candles are thus below my trend line. I think that's a more powerful way of looking at it. It's on a linear basis. And last week I said we were closing just about on it, but this is a clear break of my line. I'm going to give this a positive, saying that the long-term downtrend has been penetrated. I would not be so excited as some people in the... Uh, tweets that are saying that's the beginning of a uh, trend reversal. It might be. I doubt it. Because very often when you break a big trend line, particularly over a short period of time, uh, you go back and test it and often will break back below it again. 
I would look at this as a bull trap off of this particular trend line at this point, only because all the other things I've talked about are negative to neutral. Let's take a look at um, also this at the bottom, which is the relative strength index. I pointed out that that index um, never got oversold. And we had all of these peaks that were overbought building up to the peak of this hyperwave. For us to actually be confident that the RSI is going somewhere, it should have gotten oversold down to 30 and maybe even to 20, and it did not. So I would consider the RSI neutral. Um, okay, let's take a look at this, the same chart, but I want you to look at the bottom, the MACD. The MACD is negative. It remains negative. It will be several weeks before we will get this histogram, the red histogram, to be able to turn positive, even with upside action. So I consider that to be negative. Now, I want to briefly talk about um, some comments I've seen in Twitter that are basically saying, um, why haven't we gone to 4,000, which is what hyperwave theory says we are going to. And my answer to that is give it time. Uh, phase sevens go on for a long period of time. This is the one, this was the two, this is the three, this is the four, five, six. We are in a seven. And regardless of the fact that the phase three line gave us some hope that this would be a funky hyperwave that would bounce from seven right back off the three and start up and could take out the old highs. It did not. It is a typical phase seven. It gave a lot of power to the phase three line, but then um, dramatically and conclusively destroyed the phase three line. That's what makes it become a trend line and not a phase line. The next phase line comes down at 4,300 this week uh, down in this region, and that will be the next target. We are still in a seven. There's the hope of phase two turning the price around um, and going back up and maybe all the way back up to new highs. But we have not come anywhere near that yet. That is our next target to the downside. Okay, so we have got negatives on the death cross. We've got negatives below the trend line that used to be the phase line. We've got negatives on the stop and reverse point. We've got negatives on the Bollinger Band. We have got neutral to positive short term on Fibonacci numbers. We have got a clear positive in my mind on breaking my downtrend line. Other people have it at different places, but I'm convinced that this is um, a temporary break that could become permanent. And so I'm going to give it a full positive. We have got negatives on the MACD. We, in my mind, are negative to neutral because we haven't gone down far enough on the relative strength index. Now let's talk about phase sevens. This is the Japanese stock market at the end of a hyperwave, meaning uh, a four, a five, a six, and then a seven. Now, the questions that I'm getting saying hyperwave doesn't make any sense because you say we're in a phase seven, but we're not going down. This is what happens in a phase seven. You get these tremendous moves back up. This particular one went from 20, 19,000 up to 26,000 uh, over a 33% up move. This is a big move up.
this is a big move up. So is this, 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 and they are all still in phase seven. Why? Because we needed to go all the way down to the bottom of where the hyperwave began. Now, if we had been able to get back or hold a phase three or a phase two, that might not have happened. But this is what a phase seven looks like. It is a, an egregiously slow, difficult process, getting you lower and lower and faking you out with upside moves over and over again. Here's another simple example of international business machine back in the 1920s. A clear break of phase four into a phase five, a phase six, and then for the next three years, a phase seven, which included very big moves up. You will consistently see this until you finally get to where you're going to go. So the idea that when I say we are in a phase seven and the next target is 4,000, we might not get to 4,000 for three months, six months, a year or two years. But Hyperwave says that is where we're going. Here's another example. This is Otis Elevator. Same thing, breaking four. Here's five. Here's six. And then as seven begins, you get these big moves up, 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 up. And finally, you get to where you're going. So I said I would keep this brief. But what I wanted to make sure everybody understood is when you're talking hyperwaves, you are talking long periods of time, even in very volatile markets like gold, silver, or in Bitcoin. So the fact that we don't immediately get to a target in no way invalidates the power of what this seventh phase of a hyperwave is talking about. I would like more than anything for Bitcoin to turn around, maybe right here, and begin giving us signs that it's ready to go up, that it's ready to reverse. Even if it go, doesn't go down to 4,000, I would love for that to happen from that low of 5,900. And that's possible, but very improbable. So what you do as a money manager or what you should be doing as an investor is looking for those kind of things that I've just pointed out. And as each one goes from bearish to neutral to bullish, you can consider playing them as a trader. Some of the best um, gains can be made shorting in phase two, three, and four, as you get too far away from those trend, those phase lines but then knowing that you better get out and back into the long position as you get closer to those phase lines. And just the opposite is true. As a trader, you can do very well buying a phase seven when it gets too far below the phase seven downtrend line. Um, and you get some short-term relief in the form of a bounce opposite the main direction. But that's trading, that's speculating. For anyone that's an investor, what you would wait for is uh, I will begin buying as we get back up through 10,100, through 11,100, through 11,750. On each one of those levels, I would take a small position because there we're moving further and further out of danger. We're getting closer and closer to stop and reverse points, to trend lines breaking to the upside. And that still leaves you a lot of room uh, to be in the market long before it goes uh, to new highs. Uh, but we have not done any of those things at this point. So I just wanted to give you some perspective on these short-term bounces. 
that's where we stand. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in and for all your great comments, not only on our live chats, but also uh, on Twitter. I really appreciate it. And with that, back to Leah. Any uh, interesting questions coming in? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I guess I'll start with the first. Um, what do you think about the Adam and Eve? Um, double bottoms or patterns where you get a bottom and then you get a higher bottom, which is what Adam and Eve uh, technically basically is, uh, are interesting. And I think they um, tell you that um, the buyers are attempting to drive price up. That's why I suggested for traders um, that we will probably go higher from here, not because of Adam and Eve, but because of the things I pointed out that are turning slightly bullish. Uh, but you need to know where your targets are. And my target uh, off of this particular bounce is no higher than about 9,200. I don't think it can even get up to the overhead resistance. And, and because of that, um, what, what I would do as a trader, if I was trading this is I would look for about a 500 to $700 potential pop before it started running into trouble. That's it. Unless you guys want to throw in some quick ones, actually. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Why do we have to be in a phase seven? Can't we just still be in a phase two? Uh, we are in both. Phase two has not been violated, so, it, so it's still there sitting down at 4,400. But we are in a phase seven. And uh, that phase seven uh, is very clear because we went all the way through one, two, three, four, five, and six clearly. We tried to hold at the old phase three. That disappeared. The phase two has not disappeared but I would expect that it is going to disappear. That's why I think uh, that's not what I want to happen. And we've got proof that a phase three or a phase two can hold and become a funky hyperwave. That's what a funky hyperwave means. It means that when you're in a phase seven, three becomes strong enough to reverse the phase seven. If it is not, phase two can reverse a phase seven. But the probabilities are we're going to go back down all the way, even lower than uh, Tones 1300, unfortunately, back to the beginning below 1,000. Um, but that hasn't happened. We are where we are. And that's the way both investors, speculators, and day traders, traders have to look at this. Look at the big context. That's the driving force. And then you look at the smaller and smaller time periods and contexts and systems that can help you do what you do as either a speculator or a trader, or in my case, because of my clientele, an investor. And as an investor, I would have no part of this bounce. Um, there will be places much higher than where we are right now, where I'll become interested as an investor but not until hyperwave plays itself out one way or the other. What are good signs of a bullish reversal? Um, the best signs of a bullish reversal are capitulation. That's number one. We have not had that. You would do that with a MACD that gets way, way oversold, an RSI that gets way, way oversold, and a weekly reversal candle that drops down so everybody sells and then reverses. Those three things will tell you that uh, there's the probability or the possibility of an actual trend reversal. Now, a big downtrend line like the one that I showed you from the peak, when it is taken out, can be the first sign that a reversal might be in the offing but not until all of those other pieces we look at begin to line up and they have not. Okay. We, thanks Ty. We speak a lot about GBTC as well as ETFs. So 
Could the big whales and massive investment from Wall Street together with this wild style, really <laughs> wild style, of Bitcoin make for the funky hyperwave? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would expect it. Um, remember, GBTC was in a two, um, never got to be a hyperwave. But I have noted over and over again that the players in GBTC, because of the nature of that security, uh, where it closes at four o'clock and closes on weekends and on holidays, um, gives arbitrageurs the ability to uh, play one side of an equation against the other side, Bitcoin, that continues to trade all night long and uh, all the way through the weekends and on holidays. And I have noticed that GBTC tends to lead the direction of price particularly up. And that's precisely what it's done over the last week and a half. GBTC has been much stronger than Bitcoin. And GBTC was up uh, yesterday, is, was up uh, this morning preceding the uh, big pop we had. Yesterday's action preceded the pop we had um, this morning. And GBTC correctly predicted the big pop we had two weeks ago. Um, so the players that are playing GBTC seem to be very sophisticated. Now, um, I do not recommend playing GBTC because of that fact, because uh, very large hedge funds, the only security they can use is GBTC because it's the only one there is. So rather than being constricted to playing just on in the futures of the options market or playing Bitcoin itself, They've got another alternative. And my guess is that they are using that. But having said all of that, that doesn't change the big picture at all. That's simply a way for traders to understand uh, what is going on. I think when the final capitulation takes place, you will get some signals from GBTC. Great. We are seeing... Um... I think that in the next vlog, we can we can show you examples of GBTC and Bitcoin on the screen. I think maybe not today, if that's okay with everybody. Um, just given time. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll take this question. I like it. Um, thoughts on the VIX? Tone likes to talk about this, but yeah. I think you have a bit of a different view. And to start with, um, yes, there's no current waves outside here, but there are waves down the beach at my favorite surf spot. So there you guys go. And hyperwaves. And we're, I'm going to ride the hyperwave for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I disagree with Tone on the VIX. I think it is very, very important. Um, and I use it constantly. I, we have not shown it when we're looking at our traditional markets. Um, but um, I will. Um, but when I say it's important, it is not an important trading tool because it normally goes sideways for very long periods of time. In general, here are my rules for the VIX. Uh, when the VIX is, uh, when the stock market is steady and going up for a long period of time, the VIX will go lower and lower and lower. It's a good check on what the possibility is of a reversal of a strong market when the VIX begins moving from low to high. Low is 10, average is about 15. Long periods of time, it can get up as high as 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. In all of those times, we are in a falling stock market. Whenever the VIX begins moving higher, there is panic in the market. And it is almost always after the market has started falling, the VIX begins to rise. 
and the VIX doesn't rise for long periods of time. It spikes up. And usually when it spikes up, you're getting close to a bottom, not a top. Now, uh, in 2007, 8, and 9, we'll look at uh, where the VIX spiked and when it reversed. And in 2000, 1, 2, and 3, we'll see how high the VIX got and then reversed but then quickly dropped all the way down to low levels in 2004, five, six, and seven before the next spike that uh, led to the downturn. So that's the only way I play the VIX uh, because I'm a long-term investor. I wanna know where the level is and when something begins to happen in that level, I sit up and take notice, uh, but we will uh, cover that in another vlog. Thanks, Ty. All right. And also, yeah, I'm really dark. This is fun. Um, to someone in the live chat who said that GBTC is up 6% today. So I'll, I'll do a quick overview of GBTC and then hand this question off to you. Uh, someone asked for a, a layman's terms uh, explanation of GBTC. It is very complicated and nuanced. Um, all right. Uh, I kind of look like a ghost. Um, but it is a security, uh, it's traded OTC, it's very interesting. It is not Bitcoin, but it follows Bitcoin. So it's an interesting play, especially if you want uh, a money manager like Tyler, who can invest your 401k or retirement funds into uh, a safe exposure to Bitcoin. So it's really the only way right now until um, potentially Grayscale releases others, they're actually thinking about releasing three other alts um, and until ETFs come down the pipeline, which will be very exciting uh, for a lot of uh, money managers and other people, as well as you and I, we could uh, just open our Fidelity and Schwab account today and, and you can invest in it. So it's, it's a very interesting instrument that is very nuanced and complicated uh, given its premiums, given a kind of vesting schedule situation um yet it's it's a great it's a great way to play it um and get involved uh, as of right now potentially the value of it won't be as important moving forward in the future tyler the question back to you is has gbtc sold off before bitcoin on the downside moves can it also be predicted that way uh it has but um i i found that it is more reliable on up moves rather than down moves. I've seen about 50-50 uh, in terms of which leads to the downside. But the important, the, the single, everything uh, Leah just said is exactly correct about Bitcoin. Uh, you can get in and out of it over and over again within the day. Uh, there's a lot of volume on it. Um, so uh, you should not use market orders for any sort of size. You should always use limit orders. But the big thing is it trades at a premium and it can trade at, believe it or not, a discount to the intrinsic value of the Bitcoin that it's holding. Right now, today, at this moment, the premium is 53%. If you buy GBTC, you're going to be paying 53% more than the value of the Bitcoin in the trust. And that sounds extreme. It is not extreme. The average over the last three and a half years is a 40% premium. I would not buy it ever. I would always buy it until the next ETFs come out. When the next ETFs come out, the premium will drop to zero in GBTC. But that has not happened yet. So I would still use the idea that it trades at an average of a 40%. I would be very interested in buying as it gets close to 20%. I would be buying hand over fist when it gets between 10 and 15% premiums. Because every time that's happened over the last three and a half years, it's been a great buy place. And the only time that happens is when Bitcoin and GBTC have been falling for a long period of time. Then the premium shrinks closer and closer, below the average of 40, down to 20, down to 15, even down to 10. I was able to buy GBTC on the very lowest tick on the big drop that we had um, several months ago in February at $9.96, um, only because the premium had dropped down to 10%. I didn't buy it 
because it was $9.96. I bought it because it was a 10% premium. And on that low, it's never gone lower. On that low price, uh, it rose all the way back up to 20 because Bitcoin and GBTC began going up again. And as Bitcoin and GBTC are going up, the premium gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's at 53% now. It has gotten as high as 125%. So in a big bull market, GBTC can uh, double the value of what Bitcoin is doing. That makes it very dangerous. And you've got to know what you're doing and you've got to watch it very, very, very carefully. Um, so that's GBTC. GBTC is fun. Also, <laughs> this is really funny how dark I am right now, um, the, which we can talk about another day. But when Bitcoin forks, uh, there is an interesting situation. Uh, we can talk about that another day. What, what happened with Bcash and how they end up selling. But I like uh, your guys' questions about Elliott Waves because we do follow Hijing Lee quite closely. So Ty, um, Ba, 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 the exact question. Thank you. Crypto critical. That's a pretty good name for exactly what you're asking. Great job. All right. Regarding Elliott Wave, certain TA such as Hijing, Lee is of the opinion that this will reverse the upside. Can you just comment uh, a bit more about how hyperwaves and Elliott Waves are simpatico or not, or how they're taken into consideration, and specifically potentially your differing views with Hijing? Um, yeah, they're unrelated. Um, I talked to Robert Prechter about the, is, does he see any relationship going back historically between hyperwaves and Elliott waves? And he thought about it and gave, uh, wrote a brief answer to me saying, no, uh, other than when we're, uh, headed in a phase four up to a reversal, very often Elliot will be in a higher level, higher degree five, completing a big five at a at a top. And and that's true also at various points along the way. Certainly when you get back to a um, all the way back in a phase seven and drop back to the beginning point, you know Elliot. Uh, will be uh, closing out or becoming very close to closing out a higher degree five to the uh, to the bottom. Um, but other than that, th they move in their own worlds because uh, because of the different degrees in Elliott wave theory, you will find many, many Elliott wave positions, that at various points coincide with this large move in a hyperwave, both uh, being um, um, correlated and inversely correlated with what hyperwave is saying. And that's what I mean in terms of being able to go short in a phase two, three, or four as a hyperwave is going up, as you get too far away above the hyperwave phase line. If you turn to Elliott, you will find that Elliott will be peaking in lower degrees as you get higher and higher in their five counts, ready to begin corrective phases back down to the um, hyperwave phase lines. And then they come together again as the lines come together. So Elliott, I use Elliott a lot. I let uh, people that are better at it than I am uh, do it for me on YouTube. I like Phil Cohn a lot. I like uh, Hyjin Lee a lot. And yes, Hyjin Lee uh, has correctly, in my opinion, called this movement that we've seen for the last several weeks of um, strength in the market. And his conclusion is, that we are going higher from here. Well, you've just heard me say, I believe we're going higher from here, but I believe we're going to have a lot of trouble if we can get up to the 9,000 to 9,200 level, which happens to be one area of targets 
that he also has. So um, you should, can never get ahead of yourself from where you are looking right now at charts, other than to say that by using long-term systems like hyperwave or higher level degrees of Elliott wave, that you can draw conclusions about the probability of how far you are going to go. We are in agreement about going from where we are now to 9,000 or 9,200. We are in disagreement about saying that we have had a turnaround or a reversal in the Bitcoin market. Great. Uh, <laughs> you guys have good questions. So uh, let's take an alt question, if that's okay with you, Ty. So it, thank you, Seth. So we've said in the past, actually, that uh, we believe alts to be a sub-asset class of Bitcoin as the greater asset class, and that alts actually do follow Bitcoin. However, this is a great question, I think. Ty, can other alts be in a positive hyperwave phase while Bitcoin remains in phase seven? And to note for the viewers, uh, well, actually, I'll let you just explain, um, given historicity, where they are in their phases. But yes. So again, just uh, can they be in positive hyperwave phases while Bitcoin remains in the current phase seven? Um, no, I don't believe they can. Um, in my mind, uh, all of the altcoins can and should be played by spec day traders, speculators, but not investors. An investor should not be in any of the altcoins ever because they're fundamentally unsound, in my opinion. Fundamentally unsound, not technically unsound. Um, but that has nothing to do with uh, day trading. That has the best things you can day trade are junk that uh, are illiquid that are giving you signs to buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell. Uh, but that's not investing. That, that is, that is uh, and it's not gambling if you are very good at technical analysis. It is gambling. Gambling is 51%, 49% where the house has got 51%. It's 50-50 if you're calling a coin flip. And that's what you're doing if you're not a good technical analyst in either penny stocks or in altcoins. As you get stronger and stronger in your ability to understand technical analysis, you can become a very effective speculator in altcoins or in penny stocks or in many, many other, uh, many, many other things. But don't consider what you're doing to be investing. Investing has to do with long-term returns that you can control, that you can manage. Um, so uh, the only other point I would make there about altcoins and hyperwaves is they have not been around long enough to have established um, a hyperwave, a phase one, phase two, phase three. Those that have been around for a long time, meaning over two years or three years or four years, uh, have only made it up in my reading to a phase two. And I don't call anything in a phase two a hyperwave. You've got to make it the next step up to a phase three. Uh, but more importantly, they're all based on what Bitcoin does. So if Bitcoin is going up in a one, two, three, or four, many, many altcoins will do the same thing. Not because of any inherent properties they have, but because they're the silly, um, ugly stepchild of Bitcoins. So they get pulled along with the buggy. But when Bitcoin is going down, they all go down. Now, it is true that some of them for short periods of time will go up against Bitcoin. Irrelevant. It has nothing to do with why they go up and they go down. It simply means that money is flowing out of Bitcoin into them or out of another altcoin into them or somebody new comes along that's got deep pockets and a big purse and it doesn't take much to get it to move. 
Uh, you might listen to Phil Cohn last night or early this morning in the wee hours of the morning describing what he uh, has seen with Bitcoin and agrees that we're probably on our way up to 9,900 or so. But more importantly, his description of his ability and other traders that team together to move uh, prices in the altcoins. It does not take much. And if you're a good technician, you know where and when and how to do that. But once again, that's not investing. That's speculating, gam and, uh, trading, and getting very close to gambling. Correct. And Tyler, tell me if you disagree. But from my perspective, I always uh, think about the fact that at the end of the day, Bitcoin is the only decentralized coin. And if you have the centralization on all other coins, then the manipulation is, <laughs> you know, infinite. So you have, as we all very well know, you have certain specific people or um, a couple devs or even external forces uh, in the environment, especially with the SEC coming in and other regulators coming in, if you're trading even crazier coins, um, where you just not it's just not prudent investing. And again, to Tyler's point, sure. If you want to use TA or any other system that you've created to day trade and to have fun or to utilize tone system on a very short term time chart, then I do think that sure, uh, you could definitely make some gains, but um, depending on your mentality and also, you know, I think that everybody needs to assess what are their goals uh, for investing and what are you doing it for and what kind of investor you are. Um, it, do you have the ability to sit around your chart every single day? Um, or, uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, but um, do keep in mind the specific tech uh, behind these coins, which influences a lot of how they trade um, and also the value of their coin, which uh, then will fluctuate against their price. But do you want to, that's me rambling. Ty, do you want to make a little comment on that? No, I, uh, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, we're all very different. I love um, speculating. I love day trading personally. Um, but uh, I don't mix that up, even though I can use the same tools that I do for investing. And investing is protecting capital. It's not growing capital. If you can learn to protect your capital, it will grow when you put it, you're not making it grow. When the stock market is in a bull market for five or six or seven or eight or nine years, it's because of the bull market that you're making money. You can almost go anywhere. And in a bear market, you've got to be able to recognize you're in a bear market and you've got to get out of it. That's why holding stocks to me makes no sense. But you get to hold them for much longer periods of time and in much more predictable ways than you can with any other asset class except maybe bonds. Uh, but other than that, when you move to more specific asset classes like gold, silver, precious metals, palladium, platinum, uh, rare earth metals, as you get more and more specific, uh, you get more and more volatile. And when you get more and more volatile, you have to use less and less of those things in an investment portfolio because you can't control them like you can things like the stock market that average 10% a year for 100 years even though you can go for as long as 15, 17 years without making any gains in them. The average is still 10%. You go up two and a half years for every year you go down. And that's a winning formula, but over many years, but you still need to manage that. You've got to think about it. You've got to do stuff. That's very different than everything we're talking about in the crypto space. Absolutely. And uh, Thunderbird, I love your, your comment, Tyler. He said, everyone is a genius in a bull market. <laughs> um, so it, I guess last question that, oh, quick mention of 
Gold and silver is definitely going to be, I think, its own separate vlog, if you guys don't mind. Uh, definitely silver is a very interesting conversation. Tyler, I actually have a question for you, um, given everything we've been talking about. I don't know if you guys caught Tone's morning brief yesterday, but we had a, a conversation together about ugly old goats, recent pieces, and Tyler was cited in his most recent one about the five pillars of Bitcoin that he'd mentioned before. Now, what was very interesting to me about one of uh, Ugly Old Goat, I absolutely re recommend reading all three pieces, was that he speaks specifically that um, you must have a money management perspective when you are investing. So uh, I guess, Tyler, just to end on, uh, <laughs> uh, given everything that you're saying, do you want to give your own thoughts to those three pieces yesterday? Yeah, I, I, I think they're great, great pieces. Um, you know, a, a, when you read a reporter talking about a story, uh, there's one that uh, Leah and Tone and Jimmy talked about this morning in The Economist. You've got a reporter who is uh, reporting a report that came from Barclays Bank about the death of Bitcoin, basically. That's a very different type of reading than reading someone like, ugly old goat who uh, has spent years investing and knows the difference between investing, speculating, trading, and gambling. And here's a simple way to look at all of that. Uh, the, the fundamentals that I mentioned that he quoted uh, apply to Bitcoin, those five pillars. Some of those pillars apply to some of the altcoins, but in lesser degrees. And none of them have all five of them to the strength that Bitcoin does. Therefore, the fundamentals are on the side of Bitcoin and not on the side of those that have lesser fundamental capabilities. Okay, what do you do with that information? What I do with it is I will put a something like uh, a Bitcoin in the form of GBTC because it's tradable into investment accounts. But I limit the size of the position I will take. So I am speculating on a very volatile asset class, but I'm controlling it by the amount I would be willing to put in it. And that is not a big amount for an investment account. I would never put more than probably 10% into an account, even if we break above um, $20,000. That would be my max. And then as it went up from there, I would trim it back, back down to 10%. If it doubled, from 20,000 to 40,000, I would go from a 10% weighting. The market would take it up to a 20% weighting. I would not let it get that high. As it got up to 15, I would cut back to 10. As it got up to 15, I would cut back to 10. I would keep doing it that way. And when you're doing that, you, you, your overall portfolio is growing because of that little piece. Now, gold and silver. I would take as high as a 15% weighting. In fact, I've got a 15% weighting. In fact, I've had it ever since we got back down to 1100 in gold. When gold dropped from 1900 down to 1100, we began buying it. Many of my clients, we started buying back below $300 years ago and have held those positions all the way up to 1900 until we got a signal that it's time to step out of it and we dropped from 1900 to 1100, but we never had more than about a 15% position in that entire run up because we kept cutting back on it, which controls that portion of the portfolio. The other 70, 80, 90% are in things that uh, are either stock related or bond related through ETFs, through uh, open-end mutual funds that are no load. I would never pay a load or a commission 
to buy a mutual fund, but mutual funds in the form of index funds or sector funds uh, or well-managed funds where there's a thing called alpha, which is that that fund is giving you more than an index would uh, in a similar relationship statistically. Uh, and there are tons of those. I could give you an, 250 funds that I would buy over and above an index fund uh, because of the management of those funds, the way they are done and how they are done. So you put all that together and what do you have? What you have is a manageable group of assets where you know what the risk of various portions of that are and you follow each one of those, each one differently using technical and fundamental analysis to manage the entire process. So what you do is you continually attempt to grow your assets while things are moving in the direction that is favorable to you. And you're not afraid to cut back. I've given you examples where during the downturns in 08 and 09, where the stock market dropped 50% and the NASDAQ dropped 80%, that we moved very quickly out of anything that was related to those indexes into either cash or inverse funds that can be used and applied against assets that you are long and negate all of the risk or a very large portion of the risk. So that's the way investing at institutional levels. And when people throw out the term, I'm investing, in Bitcoin, um, if I'm a uh, because I believe in it, so I'm putting my money in it, and I'm never going to sell it. That's not investing. That's pure speculation based on faith, because you are so certain that it's going in one direction that you won't recognize when it is going against you, and you can do something about it, and you need to do something about it if you're an investor. If you're a speculator, then you can speculate and do whatever you want with it. So uh, that's a long answer to your question, but a very good question. Love it. Ooh, I'm getting it. It's like I'm the other aisle. Um, maybe I found it. That's not helpful. Sanjeev, uh, thank you so much. Uh, he said, which I totally agree, Ty, is can we do a separate vlog at some point with a deep dive into self-directing a percentage of your portfolio into GBTC and, and what you'd recommend? Absolutely. And we are, are going to do it on the gold and silver because there's um, so many people that are very interested in that. And a lot of people that disagree with me that uh, gold is in an uptrend right now. Um, but um it needs to break above uh, where it is by about $20, not much more, uh, to get going again. And until it does, you have to be careful what you're doing. Silver is a follower of gold. Silver does not lead gold. Silver is like cryptos to Bitcoin. Silver is to gold. Platinum and palladium are in a little bit different uh, area. But we will do an entire vlog on that in a lot of fundamental and technical detail. Cool. Trip, well done. Very close to Dewey. Um, okay. Well, since you're so smart, Tyler, I'll end on something stupid. Um, what did one nut say to the other nut? I don't know. I'm a cashew. <laughs> Utter stupidity. Okay, all right, everybody. Happy Friday. Is that um, wine? Is that wine you're drinking? <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit of a Irish coffee, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, everybody. Have a good one. Have a relaxing weekend. Uh, good luck investing. Keep um, the questions coming. Uh, we love the questions. We love the criticisms. Um, particularly if they're valid. Many of them are valid. Some of them are silly. Uh, <laughs> we love those too. I'm not yeah. going to lie. Sometimes we laugh. But, but keep them coming. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. Thanks.